Welcome today to, is that on? Test, test, yes. Uh, welcome today to our time of worship. Uh, really appreciate your making the effort to, uh, to come in. I am a, a stand-in today. We actually had Homer Morris booked. And he was so excited. And then, I'll be honest, his family vetoed and said he needed to be careful one more season. So we'll get him on the list for next Lent to come. And, and, and he's doing well. They just want him to be really, really safe. As we uh, start our time together, some of you have now heard some tragic news. Uh, Betty Quinn has died. We don't know a lot of details, just that she died Sunday night at home. As soon as I know more, we'll let you know as well. Um, we just pray for the Quinn family um, in that sudden loss and, and, uh, and jarring times. Um, so we pray for, for them. We also want to continue to pray for Sarah and Gray Williams. Bradley's doing fine, but Jackson now has it. That's keep it in the family. Um, so our prayer now is that Sarah and Gray don't. So we, we lift that up. Before we start, any other prayers that you'd like to lift up before the body? Yeah, I pray Hunter. For, for Hunter. I, I, Okay, we pray. And pray for our country. Always for our country. Um, you know, I have a, on my heart heavy uh, our youth and young children uh, relative to, again, this whole transitioning school year with Zoom and isolation all the way through college and just what it's doing to them um, in their souls. Some of, some of our kids are really hurting, so we pray. Pray for them. I invite you to enter into a spirit of worship. you stand. It is an awesome thing to stand in the presence of God to call on God's holy name. As far as the heavens are above the earth, God's ways are above our ways. We come with confidence because in Christ we are called to be God's people. Come, let us worship God now. Let us yield before God our hand. Let us sing, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. Thank you.
be seated and let us join together in prayer. Wise and powerful God, you have given us your light and truth to guide us through confusion. Yet we have relied instead on our human wisdom and have lost our way. Bring us back into your presence, O God. By your word and spirit, fill us with your love and truth, that we may be your people in the world and live in the confidence and joy of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Sometimes it causes me to try. 
We all have favorite hymns, don't we? I don't know about you, but the, the opening hymn, Larry, that was that was wonderful, precious song. But Rock of Ages, then that, uh, Jerry, you said that was your father's favorite, favorite song. Have you ever looked at that first stanza carefully? We sing our hymns uh, by our heritage and by rote, right? Rock of Ages, what, what rock are we talking about? The Lord. The what? Lord Jesus. Yes, yes, we are. There's a historic reference, remember, to when Moses, God was going to pass by. And, and God, Moses knew that he'd die if he saw the face of God. So what did he do? Went into a cleft of the rock. God covered Moses and passed by, saving his life. We then know that that same salvation for us is found in Jesus, the rock of ages. But what about the last of that? Be of sin the double cure. You've sung it. What do you mean? Double cure. Look at the next line. It's in two parts. Saved from wrath. That's justifying grace, the forgiveness of God the mercy that we receive, and make me pure. That's sanctifying grace. The grace of God to redeem us into holiness sake for his glory and honor. Do you see that? I want you to think about that when you sing that song. Let's, uh, let's hear now this word from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the, right, the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Gentile and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Let's pray together. Lord God, as we gather this day, pausing in our week, bring to mind your wisdom wisdom of the cross, the wisdom of your plan to redeem us, make us pure, to spend eternity together. In Jesus' name, amen. So my message is entitled, Crosses and Forks. At, at a point fairly early in my ministry, I had an experience that forever changed the way I would think about the cross. At that time, I carried in my pocket a small aluminum cross. And I was at a grocery store, probably buying a Diet Coke, and I reached into my pocket to pull out some change, and there nestled among the quarters and dimes and nickels was 
a little cross. The cashier looked over at my hand and said with a smile, Oh, how sweet. It hit me with a force. How sweet. How did the cross become how sweet? The cross that's found in pockets and in pictures dangling from chains or atop churches was in its beginning an instrument of death. Certainly early Christians didn't hang crosses around their necks. Rather, many were hung from rough-hewn crosses until they died. For Christians, the season of Lent reminds us that the cross is at the center of our faith. One of my favorite writers, Max Licato, writes of the cross these words. I quote them to you almost every year. The cross. It rests on the timeline of history like a compelling diamond. Its tragedy summons all sufferers. Its absurdity attracts all cynics. Its hope lures all searchers. What a piece of wood. History has idolized it and despised it. Gold-plated it and burned it. Worn it and trashed it. History has done everything to it but ignore it. That's the one option the cross does not offer. You cannot ignore a piece of lumber from which suspends the greatest claim in history. As hard as it is for many to believe, God revealed the ultimate love through the cross. Consider those words, no greater love does one have for another than that they would lay down their life for their friend. That's the love that God revealed in Jesus Christ. That first cross was his way of death so that we might have life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to we who are being saved, it is the power of God. We preach Christ crucified. Stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called Christ the power of God, Christ the wisdom of God. A stumbling block and foolishness. How could life come from death? How could a death give life? Because in the hands of God, the cross becomes an expression of love. Life redeeming, life creating, life sustaining love. The love of the cross opens the way to new life. A young man by the name of Aurelius Augustus was living with two mistresses and had fathered an illegitimate child. He had no secure job. He appeared to have no interest in anything except seeking pleasure. In the eyes of the religious people of his day, he was doomed to hell. But after 30 years of sinful living, Aurelius came face to face with the cross of Jesus Christ and heard the call of God upon his life. He surrendered and experienced the transforming love of God. And he became a new person. Today, we know him as Saint Augustine, who argued for the faith as one of the strongest apologists from that day forward. Of course it's foolishness and a stumbling block to some that the cross reminds us 
that the way to this new life is through death. Jesus said, if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. Paul said, to live is gain, to die is gain. As long as it is living and dying with Christ. Remember Sunday I said, he also said, it's no longer I who live. I die. It's Christ who lives in me. That is also the, the lesson of Lent. Resurrection doesn't come until death comes. After death, after the cross, a whole new life and world is open. The cross. What about a fork? Back in 2014, I shared with one of our bereavement lunches this thing. Many of you know it. There was a young woman who'd been diagnosed with terminal illness and had been given a short just three months to live. So she was getting her things in order and so she called her pastor and had him come to the house to discuss certain aspects of her final wishes. She told him which songs she wanted sung at the service, what scriptures she'd like read, and what outfit she wanted to be buried in. Everything was in order and the pastor was preparing to leave when suddenly the young woman remembered something very important to her. There, there's one more thing, she said excitedly. What's that came the pastor's reply. Now this is very important. I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. The pastor looked surprised, not knowing exactly what to say. and She smiled. That, that surprises you, doesn't it? Well, to be honest, yes. I'm puzzled. And the young woman explained, my grandmother once told me this story and from that time on I've always tried to pass along its message to those I love and who are in need of encouragement. In all my years of attending socials and dinners, we'd say church potlucks, I'd always remember that when the dishes of the main course were being cleared, someone would inevitably lean over and say, keep your fork. It was my favorite part because I knew that something better was coming, like velvety chocolate cake or deep dish apple pie, something wonderful and with substance. So I just want people to see me there in that casket with a fork in my hand. And I want them to wonder, what's with the fork? And that's what I want you to tell them. Keep your fork. The best is yet to come. The pastor's eyes welled up with tears of joy as he hugged the young woman goodbye. He knew that this would be the last time that he would see her before her death. But he also knew that this young woman had a better grasp on heaven than he did. She had a better grasp of what heaven would be than many people twice her age. Twice as much experience and knowledge she knew something better was coming. So at the funeral, people were walking by the young woman's casket and they saw the, the cloak she was wearing and the fork placed in her right hand. Over and over again, the pastor heard the question, what's with the fork? Over and over again, he smiled. During his message, the pastor told the people of the conversation he had had with the young woman. Shortly before she died, he told them about the fork about what it symbolized to her. She told, he told the people how he could not stop thinking about the fork and told them that they probably would not be able to stop thinking about it either. He's right. So the next time that uh, you reach down for your fork, let it ever so gently remind you that the best is yet to come. Crosses and forks. They remind us of the love of God, 
of the redeeming and transforming power of the cross. And that beyond the cross and death lies new and everlasting life. And that is the best yet to come. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we sing the last hymn, I'm going to pass a basket for each of you to take a fork. Let us stand and sing when I survey the wondrous cross. Receive this blessing, the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sustaining fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you this day and forevermore. And never forget, the best is yet to come. Amen. <laughs>